Bonjour. Uh, today I'll be speaking about my experiences using SQL and Rhoda to run a small government department, as well as what led us to, to adopt Ruby and these libraries. My name is Jeremy Evans, and I have been using Ruby since 2004. I work for the California State Auditor. Our office is in Sacramento, California, in the United States. We perform independent evaluations of other government departments and produce reports with recommendations to improve government. Our equivalent at the national level here in France would be the Corps des Compètes. Our department's software development approach differs from many other government departments. We build all of our custom software internally using government staff with no use of contractors. All of our internal custom software development is done in Ruby. Ruby has been our primary development language for new projects since 2005, and all of our existing internal custom systems were converted to Ruby by 2009. So all of our SQL database access uses SQL. We use PostgreSQL for our custom software development and also have to interface with Microsoft SQL Server. Occasionally, we've had to access other database libraries or databases such as Oracle and Microsoft Access. And thankfully, SQL ships with support for all the databases that we have needed to use. Most of our software development is delivered as web applications and for those, we have used Rhoda since 2014. Now, let me discuss some of the web applications that we develop. Our largest application is our intranet site called The Hub. And the majority of our development is adding new features to The Hub. And The Hub is some pretty standard intranet features. It contains a lot of information on our internal processes, has our comprehensive manual and our employee directory. Each employee has a profile page showing information about the employee such as their division, their position, audits they've worked on, audits they're currently working on, any awards they've received. The employee's profile page also has a link to a map of the floor that they work on with their desk location highlighted. And this makes it easy for new staff to navigate the office and for existing staff to easily find new staff. Most of the new development centers around automating existing processes. Now, when I started working for the department way back in 2000, Almost all of the processes were manual, paper-based processes. And now most of the common processes are automated via online forms. For example, submitting requests to take time off, attend training, get reimbursed for overtime, purchase supplies and equipment, uh, and many others are automated. Records are kept so that employees can see the status of all of their previous requests. Now, most of the processes have custom review and approval workflows that are based on different requirements. So some processes will only require supervisory review, but in other cases, they'll be between two and five levels of review with a number of levels dependent on the request and the employee's position. Now, another web application that we develop is our recruiting system. Um, that's split into two parts, a publicly accessible part that is used by applicants and an internal system that's used by our human resources staff. And most of the employees that we hire are entry-level auditors directly out of university, and most of the recruiting system is designed to handle the recruiting process for these applicants. So the recruiting system allows prospective employees to apply to take our online exam, and after applying, our human resources staff review the application, and if they approve it, the applicant is notified that they can take our online exam. So the online exam is timed and has 75 multiple choice questions, and you have to get about 80% of the questions correct to rank highly enough to advance. Now, assuming that the applicant does score highly enough, they are notified they can advance further and they can take our online writing assessment. And when the applicant begins the writing assessment, they are given a prompt and an upload form, and they have two hours to upload a writing sample that is similar in style to our audit reports. And this writing assessment is graded by our staff. So if the applicant passes the writing assessment, there is a phone interview and then an in-house interview, and the system handles all the information related to those. It also handles all the internal workflows related to processing these applications, and it has extensive reporting capabilities. And there are smaller subsystems of the recruiting system that handle the recruiting process for more advanced auditing positions. Now, another major web application we develop is our recommendation system. So one of our department's primary functions is to make recommendations to improve government. 
the departments that we audit are required to respond to our recommendations on a regular basis on their progress implementing the recommendations until the recommendations have been fully implemented. So the recommendation system is split into three parts. The first part is externally accessible, and it allows other government departments to respond to our recommendations. The second part is internal, and it allows our audit staff to add recommendations and to review responses to those recommendations. So each of those responses goes through four levels of review, and after being fully reviewed, the department's response and our assessment of their response is posted on our website. And this holds departments accountable, and their implementation of our recommendations is often considered when the legislature reviews the department's budget. We continue to follow up on the recommendations that we make to departments for up to six years after the release of our audit report. Now, the third part of the recommendation system is externally accessible, and it allows the legislature, the public, and the press to subscribe to be notified about new report releases and new responses to our recommendations. So the system also allows subscribing to receive notifications that are filtered to specific policy areas of interest. Now, how do we start using Ruby and end up using SQL and Rota? Now, I was first given the task of maintaining our websites back in 2003, and they were originally developed, before I maintained them, as static pages using NetObjects Fusion. And while I had no previous professional programming experience, I did have some exposure to PHP, and I decided to use that. So I don't actually have a copy of the PHP code we used to use, but if I remember correctly, it was something like this. So at the top of every PHP file, we'd include a library with a shared code, and this would establish a database connection and store it in the DB variable. All of the SQL statements we used were written manually. All of the values in the SQL had to be escaped and interpolated into the SQL manually. And to access data returned from the database, you would index into an array. You couldn't access the data by column name. Now, in late 2004, I heard about Rails, and I tried it out, and I saw that it was just such a great improvement over what I was doing with PHP. So using Rails, the previous PHP code, turned into this much nicer ERB code, something like this. So Rails takes care of most of the SQL creation, except for this fragment. Uh, it escapes and interpolates the submitted parameter into the SQL, and it allows for getting the returned attribute by calling a method using the column name. So after a few months of using Rails and personal projects, a few more months trying it out at work, I switched our intranet site over from PHP to Rails in the summer of 2005. And I was pretty happy working with Rails for a few years, as it made things so much easier than PHP. Now, after being exposed to SQL in 2008, I saw the benefits of SQL's method chaining approach to building queries. I converted all of our active record usage to SQL that year, and we've been using SQL exclusively since. Now, here's some example active record code from before our upgrade. This is around the time of Rails 2.0. And this code searches for paper forms, which used to be a common need before we started automating processes. Now, Active Record did not, and I believe still does not, have public API support for case insensitive searching. So you had to manually use database specific SQL. Now, back then in Active Record, you had to pass a hash of values to find, and you generally provided the filter conditions as an array with an SQL fragment and interpolated variables. In the cases where the filter conditions depended on the submitted parameters, you had to append to the first element of the conditions array to modify the SQL fragment, and you also had to append to the conditions array for each interpolated variable that you want to add to that SQL fragment. Now, with SQL, this got much simpler. Even back in 2008, SQL had built-in support for case-insensitive searching that we could use, instead of manually writing the SQL for it. Since the beginning, SQL has used a method chaining approach to building queries. So we no longer had to worry about modifying that conditions array correctly. If you notice, there's actually no SQL code fragments at all. After our switch to SQL in 2008, only a small amount of code needed to use SQL fragments. 
And as uh, SQL became more powerful, we stopped needing to use SQL code fragments. We no longer have code that uses SQL fragments or raw SQL at runtime in our web applications. All of the SQL that is executed is generated by SQL. Now, in 2008, I also learned about Sinatra. And I was drawn to Sinatra's much simpler approach to web development. In 2009, we started using Sinatra for all of our new development, and the initial versions of our recruiting and recommendation systems were written in Sinatra. Now, in Sinatra, routes are specified directly, with a block to handle the route, and the return value of the block being the response body. I found that Sinatra was much less complex than Rails, while still handling the needs of our recruiting and recommendation systems. Another thing I appreciated about Sinatra was its API stability. In the five years that we used Sinatra, we never had to modify any of our Sinatra applications due to Sinatra version changes. And that was quite different from our experience with Rails, where every Rails minor version update required application changes, and sometimes even Rails tiny version updates required application changes. While Sinatra was simple, in our experience, it was not very dry. So here's the, the previous example with the form submission handler added. Because Sinatra considers all routes separately, routes for different request methods for the same request path repeat the path. And in most cases, code inside the route handlers is also duplicated. Some cases where it was not duplicated turned out to be bugs. Now, Sinatra did eventually add support for deduplicating this logic using before filters, but it resulted in the same issues as using before filters in Rails, making the code harder to understand by making important logic no longer local to the route handler. Another issue with Sinatra was that it lacked support for handling email, having no equivalent to action mailer in Rails. So the email handling in our Sinatra applications was ad hoc and quite messy, often just inlined directly into the route handling blocks. Now, in 2014, I was exposed to the routing approach used by Cuba, and I saw how it addressed the complexity issues that we were having in our Sinatra applications while still being much simpler than Rails. So with Cuba, routes are handled in a nested fashion, which naturally dries up code while still keeping the route handling localized. And this resulted in significantly easier to understand code, at least for me. So the path itself might be broken up to handle routing different levels of the path, but no part of the path is repeated. And likewise, code used in handling the request may be separated, but the logic is not duplicated. Cuba's approach still makes it simple to see how a specific route will be handled. And while I love the nested routing aspect of Cuba, I found some of Sinatra's behavior friendlier, such as route blocks returning the response body. I also wanted the ability to easily extend the behavior using plugins, which is one of the best aspects of using SQL. So I ended up creating a fork of Cuba called Rota, integrating ideas from Sinatra and SQL, and I converted all of our applications to Rota in the summer of 2014. I did have to keep Action Mailer around for a couple of months after that in one of our web applications until Rota shipped with a Mailer plugin. So Rota's Mailer plugin routes request to send mail, similar to how Rota itself routes web requests. And we found our email handling code was significantly simpler using Rota's Mailer plugin compared to using Action Mailer. Now, one thing that became apparent after the upgrade was that our web applications were noticeably faster. And this was especially apparent in running tests with the exact same set of Capybara tests. Tests were twice as fast using Rota compared to using Rails. Now, before our upgrade to Rota, our newer applications were running on Sinatra, and our older applications were running on Rails. And switching between the two required some cognitive overhead. Starting with the upgrade to Rota, all of our applications run using the same set of libraries and use the same library versions. And that makes it much easier to switch between applications during development. And this is possible because SQL's and Rota's plugin architecture allow for what I call complexity scaling. You can easily use Rota and SQL with a few plugins to handle a small application without being overwhelmed. 
However, you can keep the same basic architecture and add plugins as needed to scale the application to hundreds or thousands of routes without having to switch libraries. And I think this is difficult to do with either Sinatra or Rails. Sinatra is not suited to large applications due to its routing architecture, and Rails is not suited to small applications due to its overhead and complexity. As I am my department's information security officer, uh, one uh, focus area for me is security. And as you would probably expect, we try to protect against the common vulnerabilities in web applications. We attempt to mitigate cross-site scripting by automatically escaping output in templates using Rhoda any Ruby, it's similar to Rails automatic escaping. And this is something we were not able to do with Sinatra. We protect against cross-site request forgery using Rhoda's route CSRF plugin and enforce the use of form-specific CSRF tokens. And this goes further than Rails CSRF protection, which allows generic CSRF tokens even when form-specific CSRF tokens are enabled. Now, Sinatra doesn't include CSRF protection. You can use Rack CSRF, but that does not offer support for form-specific CSRF tokens. Many security vulnerabilities in Ruby web applications stem from the use of unexpected parameter types by the attacker. We try to protect against unexpected parameter types by using Rhoda's typecast params plugin and SQL's type conversion to ensure that all parameter inputs are of the expected type. And this is something I think is lacking a good equivalent in either Sinatra or Rails. I mean, Rails has strong parameters but not strong enough to say what you expect the type of each parameter to be. Most of our web applications are used both by trusted internal staff and by untrusted users on the internet. And our security strategy uses different web application processes to serve these users. The different processes use separate operating system users and separate database users with reduced permissions and capabilities. And this way, an outside attacker cannot use a vulnerability in one of our web applications to perform actions that only one of our staff should be able to perform. We started doing this when we were using a Sinatra, and our usage of this has increased after our upgrade to Rhoda. This approach is difficult when using Rails unless you want to have separate application directories with no shared code. So our department has now been using SQL for over 11 years and Rhoda for over five years. And the combination of the two has made web development productive and fun. So here are a few main advantages that we have experienced using SQL and Rhoda. I think Rhoda and SQL are easier to understand and therefore easier to learn. I'm now the manager of the department's IT unit and I no longer handle the sort of day-to-day -day aspects of programming on our web applications. The day-to-day -day updating and adding features to the applications are now handled by another programmer. And this program had no professional programming experience and had never programmed in Ruby before we hired her. She was quickly able to become productive and implement new features using SQL and Rhoda. And I think if we were using Rails, it would have taken her substantially longer to become productive. We found that applications converted from Rails to SQL and Rhoda have been easier to maintain. Other than major version updates to SQL and Rhoda, we have not had to make backwards compatibility changes. And the backwards compatibility changes we have had to make in major version updates have been smaller compared to similar updates in Rails versions. Now, part of the reason for this is that SQL and Rhoda have offered plugins that implement new behavior before that behavior becomes the default, which allows for more gradual updates. Now, our applications uh, using SQL and Rhoda total over 100,000 lines of Ruby code. And we maintain and add new features on a regular basis using the equivalent of one and a half positions. As a manager, I think that is remarkably efficient. We found that SQL and Rhoda are significantly faster than Rails. I mean, faster performance when serving requests and running tests, but more importantly, faster development time to implement new features and to make requested changes. If you have not tried out SQL or Rhoda yet, I encourage you to experiment with them and see if you also experience the same benefits that we have experienced. And that concludes my presentation. I'd like to thank all of you for listening to me. I have about five minutes for questions, so if you have any questions, please ask them now. Merci beaucoup.
Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, how long did it take you to convert the Rails apps to Rota? Uh, let's see. Um, I believe the, the Rota app, uh, the Rails app that we maintained, it was converted between the release of Rota 0.9 and Rota 1.0. Um, the Snatcher applications were converted before then. Uh, I want to say probably a week, maybe two. Um, and that, that application is the largest one. That had, had, had a, probably at the time about 40,000 lines of code. Um, a lot of it uh, was not too difficult because the way we structured our, uh, our Rails applications, it made it fairly easy to take each method um, that corresponded to an action in Rails and convert it to a block in Rhoda that we, we use to handle the request. So, it, I mean, it took a lot of time simply because there was a, a lot of code. Um, but in most cases, the transition was not that difficult in terms of, um, did that, we didn't have to make extensive changes. It was more, more mechanical in mind. I mean, it still had to be done by hand, but it was, many of the changes were mechanical in nature as exposed to thinking about how we needed to transition it to work. First, sorry. First thing, thank you for those two amazing libraries. I always encourage people to try them. And uh, I'm curious, how do you use SQL as a low-level database access library or uh, with the active record pattern with the SQL model? I'd say in most cases, um, I think there's two, two different ways we use it. So if we're dealing with something where we're trying to modify a particular row, like one row, um, in a lot of cases, that's what we're doing. And I think active record approach works very well for that. You retrieve the database value, you update it with a new value, it makes sense. Um, for a lot of our reporting systems, though, we're using um, sets of libraries. We, you know, basically, you're trying to produce reports, um, some mations, and, that, and for that sort of stuff, we're often using the low-level, what we call SQL core, um, where we're not dealing with objects at all, it's just hashes. Um, so each, each, basically, it's an array of hashes in most cases, uh, array for each, one, one hash for each row in the database. Um, I, just like uh, Philip talked about, uh, a lot of, when I think about code, a lot of it is thinking about data structures um, and primitive objects, as you call. I mean, uh, I, a lot of SQL and Rhoda suffers from what people, it's an anti-pattern of primitive obsession. Um, I don't necessarily consider that a bad thing in some cases. So a lot of the, the design of SQL is designed with these primitives, these low-level objects that everyone using Ruby already understands. There's very little to learn. You see a hash, you know what it does. You see an array, you know what it does. Um, there's not needs to wrap everything in objects. Can I have a follow-up question? Sure. Mm -hmm. Active support? Do you use that? Oh no, no, okay. no. no. Okay. I, 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 I do not use active support in any of my libraries, and I will tell you that even though none of my libraries use active support, there are bugs that people ex report in my libraries specifically because active support is used in the same process, and it basically breaks the API that you would normally use. Um, JSON, some time parts. Uh, it's not something I would recommend anyone use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I endorse that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Uh, hi, and thanks for presentation and your work. But the problem we face, <laughs> not we face, but I face a couple of times, is because the dependencies are dependent on active records. That's why yeah. making transitions of applications almost Never works out. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's in general a trade off when you're using something that's I mean, SQL and Roto, of course, uh, Hanami. Um, so much stuff is written for Active Record, for Rails. So many other developers are familiar with Active Record and Rails and not familiar with other things. Um, when we were hiring, we looked for people with existing Ruby experience. We didn't get any applicants. I mean, it's hard to, it's kind of hard to hire um, for government work because we pay so much less than uh, the private sector does. Um, so we, that's why we found someone um, that had programming ability, but not, uh, I'd say, but not, not didn't have programming experience or exposure to any of these Ruby concepts. And that's why I think uh, Rails, I think, is more difficult to learn. It's just that so many people have already done it. That's why it makes it easier to hire for. 
Um, but yeah, certainly you're making a trade-off when you use these libraries. You have to be aware that other libraries, or it reduces the space of other libraries you can use. Uh, there's usually, I would say, at least with Rhoda, for most things you would want to do in Rails, um, with Rails there might be three or four good equivalents. Um, like if you think of authentication, you think of device, sorcery, clearance, that sort of thing. Um, with Rhoda, there's often only one decent solution, and you basically have, have to use that. Um, in most cases, there is one decent solution, and in some cases, there may not be any. Um, but in most cases, at least everything that we've had to do, there's at least one good solution in Rhoda. You just don't have as much choice as you would have in Rails. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.